Our guests are in the hot seat for this hour and um, in the persons of Honourable Justice Diana Mochache, who's a judge of the High Court of Kenya. Good morning. Good morning. Karibu sana. Asante. And also, our uh, guest this hour is Scott Asfag, who is the United States Department of Justice a Resident Legal Advisor for Nairobi. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for having us on. Thank you for being here. This is the hot seat of the Situation Room. And it's interesting because today the conversation is quite a hot one. Um, we're looking into issues of <laughs> transnational organized crimes and illicit, illicit financial flows. It already has a foreboding effect when we just say those words. And so we're looking at the effective adjudication of that. And we're talking about that this morning. To welcome you in Situation Room Fine Form is CT with today's proverb. Our proverbs for the whole of this week come from the country of Kenya. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of the week that I will not specify which part of the country the proverbs come from. I leave it to our listeners, the audience, to determine if the proverb resonates with any proverbs they have <coughs> in their neck of the woods. How easy it is to defeat people who don't kindle the fire for themselves. How easy it is to defeat people who don't kindle the fire for themselves. Hmm. Justice, maybe we hear from you. What what would be your interpretation of that? <laughs> um, because uh, if someone has not kindled the fire, they don't know the mechanism of lighting that fire. So they may actually have the fire because someone else has done it for them. Uh, but because they do not know how to put it off, uh, I mean, how to light it, 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 it becomes difficult uh, for them to relight the fire if it is put off by someone else. Hmm. So unless you work hard, unless you work for something, you wait to be given or trickle down uh, from other people to yourself, then you do not know how to look for it. City normally has points that he gives, but let's wait until Scott gives us his interpretation and we we'll see how generous he's feeling today. <laughs> it's a difficult reader. <laughs> it's a great question. I, what, uh, what I thought of was personal integrity, mm -hmm. that if pre people don't have their own strong sense of morals, strong sense of purpose in life, mm. uh, strong sense of mission, uh, then when others come into their lives and offer alternatives, they're easily, dis they're easily moved. Uh, and where people do have those strong personal values, uh, they can resist those people who come and offer uh, sort of how can, uh, things that uh, are transient and uh, don't hold up over time. So. Mm. Now, the amazing thing about Proverbs is that your interpretation cannot possibly be wrong <laughs> because it is your interpretation. We listen to a proverb and we normally speak of it in the manner it resonates with us. And so there will be different supposed interpretations and they're all right. So this is a good week. On a scale of one to ten, you both have eleven. Oh, I told you. <laughs> Interesting. The man is feeling generous. <laughs> Even on a Thursday, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Only that he did not say mm. that he expected us to react. Would have been more keen. Oh, wow. I, well. I thought it was for the audience. You, you never know. <laughs> Through the conversation, yes. it, it might rear its head again. So, yes. you know, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> radar up. Yes. Okay, so we're looking at the strengthening the adjudication of transnational, uh, over transnational crime as well as illicit financial flows. It, it feels like a mouthful. It feels like there's a lot that's going on, and uh, in terms of these crimes and uh, illicit financial flows, they've been almost become kind of buzzwords in our conversation when we talk about justice, or when we talk about transnational um, integration, or when we talk about transnational relationships maybe we can start it off with a little a, a bit some some definitions of what we are exactly we're looking at when we're talking about um transnational crimes what falls under this maybe we can start with you uh justice Mochache. Yeah, thank you uh these are generally crimes that transcend borders mm. crimes that cross from one country to another mm -hmm. that is why they are transnational 
Uh, some of these crimes are smuggling of immigrants, mm. uh, trafficking in humans, especially women and children who are the most vulnerable, trafficking in narcotic drugs. Mm. Uh, we don't manufacture narcotic drugs, but somehow we get them into this country. Where do they come from, especially cocaine and heroin? We are looking at um, trading in wildlife trophies. Mm -hmm. uh, as much as we have elephants in this country, poachers are killing them, but we don't have use for those uh, ivory. So where are they being taken? It means they are being sold across country. Then terrorism, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we have been hit in this country by terrorists and investigations have established that some of those uh, offenders are actually foreigners. So they crossed over from other countries into our country. Mm. Corruption, corruption as well. How does that terrorist cross over into Kenya? Could someone have turned a blind eye? Uh, those are some of the ones that I can think about uh, right now. Mm. Yes, and of course, smuggling of weapons and even parts. Uh, they come in small parts and then they are assembled in this country. Mm. Yes. Okay. So the origin, destination, all of this involves several countries at once. Several countries, yes. All right. Yeah. Scott, when we look at um, illicit financial flows, um, what are we talking about here uh, exactly? So illicit financial flows, it, given the example that the Honorable Machachi just made, uh, let's talk about terrorism. Mm. Uh, terrorism can't exist without the people being involved in it, uh, supporting themselves through financials. Uh, so money that flows into and out of terrorist regions uh, really defines the problem. If we can stop the money flowing to those organizations, it cuts off their ability to continue their operations. Uh, and that money flows across borders uh, through electronic means mainly. Uh, and those, illic those illicit flows uh, are something that all of us in law enforcement are looking for ways to stop. Mm. All right. When we also talk, then talk about strengthening the adjudication of over both of these matters, I mean, we look into some of them and examples of such and how we see those playing out. When we talk about the strengthening of the adjudication of this, are we alluding to the fact that perhaps there are gaps through which these crimes continually <coughs> continue, um, transnational organized crime? Do we say that there are holes, there are gaps in the system, and then how can we start to strengthen? Okay. Um, yes, there are gaps. One, uh, these crimes are committed clandestinely. Uh, there is no person who can go and broadcast himself and say, hey, I'm bringing drugs from South Africa into Kenya. Somehow you find women have been given pellets to swallow. Mm -hmm. uh, people have removed uh, soles of shoes and stuck uh, drugs. You find logs have been harvested holes have been dug in and ivory actually fixed in there so there is a way of disguising uh these uh, uh commodities in order to bring them uh, into this country or from this country to another country uh how it happens it is because criminals are always ahead of uh, uh, law enforcement officers they are advanced in their thinking they think ahead of how are we going to evade arrest that is actually the, the the life of a criminal he has to think harder he has to be more innovative so there are gaps due to the fact that uh, law enforcement officers more, more often than not react uh, rather than being proactive and that is how why we need to come up with ways of strengthening uh, law enforcement officers uh, having capacity building for judicial officers as well and prosecutors so that adjudication becomes easy uh, so that when uh, the law enforcement officers uh, mainly rely on intelligence information to arrest the offenders we would like as judges and magistrates to understand what they go through because the crime itself is 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 very complex mm -hmm. it, it it is like yeah a yarn you know the wool the way you you know you need mm -hmm. if you undo it badly going back to where the origin mm -hmm. is very very complex or even look at a, a spider web just try and follow it slowly by slowly without destroying it to see where it starts. to see where it started or oh, it just talked about a jigsaw puzzle trying to piece the puzzle together is very very 
uh, tiring, uh, very, very complex, and you require patience and techniques. So that is where we have a little bit of gaps mm. uh, as a region. Uh, as a region, we are headed there, but then there are those gaps. Uh, hence, uh, this regional organization uh, to think about how Africa generally can come together to try and um, and, and, and adjudicate these cases and, and obviously um, uh, try and, and see how to close the loopholes mm. and the gaps. If yeah. I may ask, yes. whenever we think of loopholes and we think of crime and criminals, yes. is there a body of evidence that indicates that there are jurisdictions where people have managed to actually either reduce or at least bring some of these activities to a bare minimum? And if indeed... There are such cases. What did they do to achieve this? Okay. Yes, we have uh, what we call international best practices. We are looking at, for instance, the US, the UK, they are way ahead of us. And because they have leveraged on technology, and because they also speak to the public, they encourage members of the public, if they see something, they should say something. Uh, in this country, uh, people can actually, you can be mugged in the streets and people just pass by and do nothing. But uh, 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 in the U.S., for instance, members of public are told if you keep quiet and something happens, then you'll always feel guilty. So I think they're way ahead of us. And then they have trained the investigators and also the the equivalent of our in national intelligence services collects information, members of public also share information, and they are very, very sure that their identities may not be disclosed. Mm. So in this country, maybe, maybe, members of public may see, but fear to share. So do I hear you to be saying that the members of the public in yes. a country like the U.S. Yes. are themselves at the very forefront? Yes of this fight. They are aware <laughs> and there seems to be mutual trust between them and law and enforcement agencies. So yes. they are able to work together. They are able to share information yes. knowing very well that that information, their identities rather, will not be disclosed. They have also been educated to know, for instance, in a hotel, when a suspicious person is checking in, a receptionist will check him in and quietly make a report about that suspicious person. The banks as well, whenever there's a suspicious transaction, that information is quickly shared among law enforcement officers without disclosing the identity. So I think they're a little bit way ahead of us in terms of technology, in terms of trust, trust in the system as well. So there's a little bit of that trust lacking amongst members of public, vis-a-vis -vis law enforcement officers, and obviously uh, intelligence officers. I shouldn't speak ill of my country, but yeah. are we then saying, okay, let me not lump you in onto this, let yes. me say it. Yes. Because everything you've said is something that we don't have, literally, because there's a huge gap of mistrust, or should we say there's a lump of it, there's a an entire truckload of it. Yes. Between starting with people who are in government and the public. Then you go to the security forces, it's the same. The police force, it's the same. Mm -hmm. So now, this trust deficit, mm -hmm. would you therefore then say that it actually helps exacerbate the situation that we're talking about? Yes, I would not say it's a huge load of mistrust, but I would say yes, there is that mistrust. Because let me take you to northeastern Kenya. Yes. Why do we have terrorists actually killing locals? Mm. Do you want to say that someone, someone did not realize? Are they so smart that the locals actually won't know? Some of them come actually unsettled. And so maybe even these Kenyans fear that if they were to relay this information, the terrorists will come after them. Mm. That is actually one of the reasons. And... Uh, with respect to uh, confidence, uh, it, it is growing. We are getting there. Slowly by slowly, information is being shared, but not as much as uh, the other countries who are way ahead of us. Justice, I apologize for putting you on the spot. Yes. Even what it is you do. That is why I took the burden on myself and said it is I yes, it who, is is who is saying it. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. 
Yes, yes, see, yes. You are where, right. From where I sit, um, rather from where we sit, this deficit of trust yes. is a terrible thing. Yes. To have in a country as a hard currency. Because even things that could easily be done mm -hmm. become an uphill task. Yes. And so even the very process mm -hmm. and the very things that we are now discussing mm -hmm. acquire very phenomenally huge <coughs> features that it need not have. Mm -hmm. But as you correctly put it, because people do know yeah. the criminals in their midst. They do know them. Yes. But so long as that deficit exists, mm -hmm. they would rather even side the criminals yeah. and not with the law enforcement or the people who are actually there to try and make their lives better. Mm. Yes. They actually just they may keep quiet, yes. not necessarily side with them. For instance, when drugs are crossing into the country, either through the ports or through the airport, uh, sometimes you wonder whether someone did not see and keep quiet or they just feared. You know, criminal networks are also very dangerous. Terrorists are very dangerous. So as a member of public, you may want to just lie low and find a law enforcement officer you can easily trust to share that information. No, we need to do more, encourage the public, uh, speak to the public that the identities will be protected if this information is shared. And it's happening a lot. Mm. It is happening a lot. Um, the administration, of course, the local chiefs, um, assistant chiefs, even the village elders are sharing inf information. The government has come up with the Nyumba Kumi initiative, Know Your Neighbor. So that has helped a lot. Mm. So that if someone who is suspicious moves into an area, then that information is relayed to the administration. If we're looking at strengthening of adjudication, Scott, I mean, you sit in a, tw it's kind of like a split screen position. As a resident um, advisor, for for the US DOJ here in Kenya. With that split screen experience, what have you seen that has worked, that the DOJ perhaps has used uh, in terms of mechanisms for strengthening um, that can actually work here? Because that has been one of the problems here. When we look at organized crimes um, in this part of the world, oftentimes is that how to deal with them has been an issue because we're looking at cross-border, we're looking at sovereignty, we're looking at so many things uh, at the same time while trying to stop financial, illicit financial flows, stop organized crime. So what would be borrowed lessons that actually are being used as mechanisms for fighting these two? Uh, I think it comes down to just one word and that's mm. collaboration. Mm. Uh, we need to be working together. Uh, you know, I've heard this discussion uh, th that's just taken place, and as I was sitting here, uh, my thoughts go to the go to the fact that we can't forget that organized crime and transnational crime happens in the United States mm -hmm. too. We're not immune to it. It starts there. It flows from there. It flows into the United States as well. So we are, if not part of the problem, we're all part of the solution, mm -hmm. and the solution comes through collaboration. And how do we do that? We do that through transnational treaties, the UN Treaty on Transnational Organized Crime, that Kenya is a signatory to. We do it through use of what are called mutual legal assistance treaties, which Kenya and the United States are part of. And it all boils down to how do we work together, both law enforcement and the judiciary, uh, as these cases flow through the system. If Judge Manchache can't get evidence in front of her mm. as she's trying to contemplate a case, uh, then she has no ability to rule um, because she has nothing uh, in front of her. So we need to make sure as lawyers and as prosecutors that we're getting evidence in front of the court that's valid and that uh, has uh, legal sustainability. Mm. And those are, those are done through mutual legal assistance treaties. One country helping another country get evidence in uh, that is acceptable to the court. Has so, it been harder or easier over time when you speak of collaboration and say between countries because one would assume then that there are a number of countries involved when it comes to these treaties for example um, has it been easier or difficult or more difficult over the years to get these collaborative efforts into play I think it's getting easier it's getting easier through electronics and through digitization um, but countries with less accessibility to 
uh, legal resources as an example, uh, it makes it more difficult for them to engage in mutual legal assistance. And one of the reasons that our, the Department of Justice has people like me in different countries is to assist with these mutual legal assistance treaties. Uh, we're here to as a liaison between Kenya and the United States mm -hmm. and other countries to help make sure that as Kenyan prosecutors are trying to work through uh, and get evidence from the United States or other places that we can lean in where necessary and help. Mm -hmm. That's our job here. The fact that you have to have treaties points to the fact that it's been acknowledged that that problem exists between the countries who are signing the treaties. And that in signing the treaties, they are perhaps trying to forge a way through which they'll be able to resolve, solve, eliminate, reduce these issues that they're talking about. But when it comes to finances, I, I, I find financials tricky. Tricky in this sense. On the one hand, you have countries that are considered financial safe havens. Okay. And sometimes I'm not certain whether I can actually differentiate between what is fiction and dramatized in movies and what the reality is. The ability of someone to even go into a financial institution and have a safe box where they keep whatever it is. And it isn't something that you bank, so it isn't in the books or the annals of the bank. It's just that is your property, you're the one who has access to it. And then entire institutions who don't question you too much about uh, the monies that you have in their country. Probably that's why they're called safe havens. Now, they exist within countries. Kenya has a sort of treaty that I want you to speak of with the country of Switzerland. And the understanding was so that information can be shared if individuals within this country have stashed money mm -hmm. that whose origins are at best dubious, the Swiss government is able to share that information with the country. But then, even when we have all these things, that process of actually getting to adjudicate and work on it is slow. Mm -hmm. Very slow. There was a case, I think it was in Nigeria, with mm -hmm. the funds of the uh, former late president called Abacha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I hear, the, from what I understand, the mm -hmm. determination was that the money would be returned, but it would be returned to the people not to the government, meaning it would come in the form of aid or, or mm -hmm. something. Now, how do you navigate the waters so that whatever it is that is intended in the treaties is done expeditiously? I say this is because if it takes a long time, the purpose for which it was intended may actually be defeated. That's a challenge for all of us. It's a challenge for the United States trying to get information from other countries, and it's certainly a challenge for Kenyan law enforcement trying to get the information. I don't have the answers as how we make it faster, but part of it is through these mutual legal assistance treaties. Mm -hmm. They do have to be reviewed by law enforcement and the lawyers in the various countries. But we need to move quickly once we, once each country realizes that there's probable cause or reasonable suspicion to believe that money is being held overseas, <laughs> we need to move more quickly to try to uh, seize that money and secure it for uh, the mm -hmm. people from whom it was taken. Uh, do I have an answer how we can make that faster? Uh, one of the reasons I think that we can make it faster is through collaboration. The first thing is really, can we do it in a more informal way first? Can we find out whether uh, through like Interpol, as an example, uh, through Interpol communications that are more informal than the treaty-based formal processes? Can we find out what is available, what might be available? Then, of course, there's people who come forward. The Pentagon, excuse me, the Panama Papers mm -hmm. is an example, right? Mm -hmm. Where people who were hiding money in, a, you know, in private bank accounts. Mm -hmm. Then there's a broader issue: Can the government then put uh, pressure? Can various governments put pressure on another government to change their banking practices uh, to make sure that people don't have the ability to privately hide wealth stolen from people? of another country. What about strengthening the um, security, investigative, intelligence bodies within a country? Because when I say strengthening, I mean ensuring that they're actually able to do what it is to carry out the mandate that they have. Because if you have a situation where those who are involved in these 
nefarious activities have more power and more money than those who are supposed to investigate them, then it's a zero-sum game. <coughs> the likelihood of moving forward is, 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 is extremely slim. Case in point, and again, this is me saying it. Mm. We live in a country where there are many people who are declared millionaires, some even billionaires. It's until recently that I understood to be a billionaire, there needs to be nine zeros attached to whatever figure. <laughs> I had gotten around to understanding a million. A billion has taken me a bit of time to understand. The person or these individuals don't have any visible enterprise that you could say produces the value that gives them the wealth, and yet they're wealthy. And many of them are actually government officials. So when this is obvious and you have bodies who are set up specifically to deal with this, unless they're strengthened, they will not go far. They will even point, they will even mention, they will even know. But it gets to a point where you actually cannot prosecute. Mm -hmm. you, you, there's, there's very little that you can do. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, just the other day, the EACC, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission, announced their new five-year plan yep. uh, and rolled that out here. And I think that's a very laudable uh, addition to what they're already doing. And they are moving forward. But you come. your question reminds me of your parable. It's about integrity first, <laughs> correct? <laughs> uh, so what we need to be doing broadly, all of us, is to... Uh, use the tools that we have to that we all know, whether they're in the Bible or whether they're in a whether they're in a law book, to move forward in a way that we all know is the right way. Okay, uh, and uh, that's that's one of the reasons, and I hope we get to talk about it. Mm -hmm. That's one of the reasons why uh, starting next week, uh, judges from uh, 16 different countries are coming together in Mombasa to talk about this very issue, mm -hmm. to get training, to mm -hmm. be able to collaborate, mm -hmm. and to work together to find ways to make sure that when people engage in transnational organized crime, uh, mm -hmm. they do come, and they do come into the courts uh, yeah. that the judges have what they need mm -hmm. to, to find an yeah. appropriate, appropriate solution. Yeah. One question about both of these two issues is, who are the victims? When we look at crime, uh, we say that they are victims. Mm -hmm. In this case, are we saying that nations essentially are victims? We're talking about economic crimes. Mm -hmm. We're talking mm -hmm. then about organized crime. Mm -hmm. Some of the things you talked about, uh, Justice Mochache, of mm -hmm. smuggling and terrorism and human trafficking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. So countries are victims, mm -hmm. isn't it? Yes. One would assume then that we would all be chasing our tails to make mm -hmm. sure that these loopholes that you talk about are actually tightened. Mm -hmm. um, and the treaties that we speak of and making sure that some of these things then come to book. Mm -hmm. How then are we able to make sure that certain things that we put in place are actually implemented? And do we see that there is an appetite from country to country? Is there an appetite to implement some of these things that the treaties have mandated by virtue of the fact that countries are signatories to this, do we see that there's local implementation yes. mm -hmm. of some of these mechanisms? Yes. Thank you. Uh, we actually, countries are victims, but we have human beings as victims uh, because a country, say the Republic of Kenya, is made up of Kenyans. So whenever an offense is committed against the Republic of Kenya, the people who suffer are human beings. Let's take, for instance, in a case of trafficking uh, in persons. Uh, it is actually people who are taken from one country to another country. When we talk about terrorism, uh, as much as buildings are destroyed, some of those buildings are private property, some belong to the country, but within the buildings, within any place where there is an attack, it is actually human beings who die. Mm. At Westgate, we lost 67 people, and you could clearly see that the target was not the building itself, it was the people of Kenya. The Dusit attack, as much as it is the hotel that was targeted, but you know, you cannot just blow up a building and get gratification from it as a terrorist. They want to see mass murder. Mm. That is how they get gratification. So when you talk about drug trafficking, if you go to Mombasa, for instance, there are young people and families destroyed. People wake up in the morning to just go and buy heroin and take every day hopelessness, children have dropped out of school. So the country is affected, but we have real human beings who are suffering. So with respect to trafficking, 
uh, the country has actually come up with the Counter Trafficking in Persons Act mm -hmm. to ensure that these people who traffic humans, women and children, are actually taken to court and charged if they are arrested. And then the victims are taken back to their countries. Uh, they're subjected to psychological support. And if they are from, say, Ethiopia or Eritrea, they're sent back home. And if they are Kenyans who have gone abroad, it becomes even more difficult to bring them back, as you have seen. Now, uh, with, respect, with respect to narcotics, drugs, we have an act. Uh, you have seen people arrested, the Psychotropic and Substances Act. When people are arrested, they are taken through the court system. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we actually, as the judiciary, insist on the rule of law. We are not a jungle republic. As much as these people commit heinous crimes, they are taken through the judicial system and uh, actually their rights are observed. Uh, we have also the Prevention of Terrorism Act, uh, which deals with uh, people who commit terrorism mm. and terrorism-related offenses. Uh, corruption as well, we have the Economics and Crimes Act. And in fact, the, the country has done much more than that. We have a special court which handles corruption in this country, mm -hmm. right from the magistracy to the high court. It is not contaminated. Every morning they wake up, they go to court handling nothing but economic crimes. With, this, uh, with this, uh, reference to terrorism, we have Shanzu law courts and Kahawa law courts. Right. The magistrates posted to those courts wake up in the morning to handle nothing but terrorism and transnational organized crimes. Like Kahawa law courts is situated within committee prison. I am actually the judge uh, that has supervisory jurisdiction over that court, mm -hmm. as well as Jomo Kenyatta International Court, which deals with the drug trafficking cases mm -hmm. only. Okay. So the judiciary has, as a country, and through the judiciary, the chief justice has designated magistrates and judges to uh, uh, handle those special uh, crimes. Uh, with respect to wildlife trafficking, these cases again go to Kahawa law courts mm. as well as uh, Shanzu law courts. So uh, there are acts of parliament, there are magistrates uh, who have been trained and judges, and also specific prosecutors who prosecute in those cases right yes scott one would assume that because that there are that because there are treaties and that there are sovereign states who come together uh, to form these treaties the assumption is that everybody's having a kumbaya moment and everybody's then very happy about the things that we discuss uh, when it comes to agreements or cooperation when it comes to some of these crimes illicit financial flows comes front and center with this but is it the case that everybody is in agreement in terms of what needs to happen when it comes to adjudication? If somebody, for example, is arrested in Kenya and is a foreign national, is that person then subjected to the laws of Kenya? Or is there an agreement that says this person may then be repatriated to their country to then face the law there? One would assume that because of a treaty that is in place, that it doesn't matter where you might be apprehended that you would then face the arm of the law in that country. Is that the case and should it not be? Of course, each each nation is a sovereign state. Mm -hmm. So if a person commits a crime here in Kenya uh, that originates in another uh, country, they can be prosecuted in both countries. Mm -hmm. uh, if they are doing acts here in Kenya, they should be, in my opinion, prosecuted here in Kenya. Then after they serve their sentence and punishment here, they should be returned to wherever their country is. And if they've committed a crime there, then that country should also be looking to see uh, whether they should be prosecuted in that country for their criminal acts there. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing you say, because mm -hmm. we've had a case mm -hmm. of the Akasha brothers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. who were repatriated to the US. Mm -hmm. they, their crime was drug trafficking mm -hmm. and their drug trafficking was here. Mm -hmm. So explain to me what sort of legal jurisdiction is that where someone commits a crime here? Mm -hmm. Is this what you're trying to say that the crime is committed here but it affects people in a different jurisdiction? Mm -hmm. So is it, or is this where now the treaties come in? So I don't know the facts of that case that you're mentioning, yes. uh, but if criminal activity is taking place in one country, yes. but the flow of illicit drugs mm -hmm. goes to the United mm -hmm. States, they've committed a crime in the United States or mm -hmm. any other country where those drugs have flowed. Mm -hmm. If that country seeks to prosecute mm -hmm. and 
goes first, in essence, mm -hmm. uh, through extradition treaties and other manners. Mm -hmm. Those individuals would be moved to the country in which a crime was committed in that country. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not to say that after they've been convicted or charged there, that they can't be returned mm -hmm. here to Kenya to be charged again with criminal activity here. Mm -hmm. A bit tricky, because if the sentence is a life sentence, I mean, the only time you can come back to that country is in the afterlife. So. <laughs> I understood. It wasn't a life sentence, actually. It was no, it wasn't. Five. Yes. yes. No, it, it wasn't. Yes. I, I, I'm yes. just mentioning that yes. if it is a life sentence, yes. Yes. then clearly, yes, it was yeah. 25 yes. years. Yes. <laughs> Yes. I mean, <laughs> Justice Mochacha, maybe you can give some light to that yes, as well. Yes, let me because here we are talking about um, yes. are we saying that it is a level playing field mm -hmm. for all countries that are in these agreements? Because then where does the conversation come in about this is our national who may have committed a crime, bring them back here and mm -hmm. let us try them at home? Mm -hmm. Are there superiority levels within mm -hmm. these treaties? Are there superiority levels between these mm -hmm. agreements when we talk about mm -hmm. strengthening adjudication? Mm -hmm. Does one country's sovereignty outrank another? <laughs> Yeah, not necessarily. We have uh, treaties, extradition mm -hmm. and contiguous treaties, mm -hmm. uh, CAP 76 and 77. So uh, extradition is allowed if countries have signed the extradition treaty. Where there is no extradition treaty, uh, countries can enter into an MOU. Okay. In which case then, the Attorney General receives a request to extradite. Remember, we are talking about transnational organized crimes. Mm -hmm. The drugs leaving Kenya may have had a greater effect in the U.S. Or drugs leaving South Africa may have had a greater effect to Kenyans. Mm -hmm. And therefore, Kenya can make a request to South Africa to have a person who has committed those crimes extradited to be tried in Kenya. That is what happened uh, with the Akasha brothers. Mm -hmm. An MOU is generated. A request first comes to the Attorney General then they they gener they generate an a memorandum of understanding specifically that the offense the person with is going to face in the other country must be an offense in this country and the person should not be subjected to you know a punishment that Kenya would not uh, generally uh, subject a person to yeah but superiority there are some countries I know who may not have signed certain treaties they actually decide that their citizens will not be tried abroad yes. if they are arrested yes yes one of them is the US actually yes yes but um that is the u.s as for kenya as with kenya we have signed quite a number of treaties and they come in handy but remembering also that uh we are the ones who actually experiencing most of the 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 the, the, the wrath actually of these crimes for instance terrorism mm -hmm. uh terrorists um have hit Kenya more than any other country, of course, in, within the region. So we actually would like to cooperate with other countries. Even if they are not cooperating, uh, maybe they are slightly at a higher level. We do not know. They are more advanced. They know how to tackle those crimes. But as we prefer to collaborate uh, with those other countries. Yeah. Scott, this training that you speak of, tell us about how it is that it is going to meld into what we're discussing here yeah great uh one of the things that you know one of the roles that we have here we meaning i have a partner here jody young who is another resident legal advisor uh, our job here is to really assist we're not here as prosecutors in Kenya. Uh, we're here to uh, assist the judiciary uh, with training. We're here to assist the ODPP with training and any other assistance that we can offer, uh, as well as doing the work that I mentioned earlier, helping in transnational organized crime as, as a liaison between the United States and Kenya. In this particular case, the Kenyan Judicial Academy uh, saw a need and what they saw was a need to bring uh, judges uh, from across Africa together to talk about transnational organized crime and illicit financial flows. Judges have a, I can say this as a lawyer, mm. I know that judges have a really hard job. I can prepare a case for years and be ready to walk into court and present my case. And my job is to convince this judge that uh, my case is worthy and deserves in, as a prosecutor a conviction. Uh, my case may be taken an hour in her courtroom 
and then another lawyer comes in who's prepared for hours on a different matter with a completely different subject comes in and does the same thing. So judges have a hard job. They need to know a lot about everything. It's not just a wide and shallow river. They need to be wide and deep. Uh, and so this conference is intended to, uh, the JKA is, has in their wisdom has said, let's bring people together to one, talk about the issue first of all. Uh, so uh, sensitize judges to the issues of transnational organized crime broadly, and then share experiences uh, with how we can work better together uh, across Africa uh, to assist each other as judges in transnational organized crime uh, proceedings. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to hear what may have been seen as um, mechanisms that would be, that would, all right, let me ask questions differently. Have we seen over time a reduction or increase in um, transnational organized crime? Illicit financial flows have been kind of like on the back burner, but they're happening all over the place all the time but have we seen a reduction in these crimes transnational organized crime and have we seen anything that has set as um kind of like uh, have we seen anything that has been set to stop these crimes from happening based on any kind of action that has been taken judiciously to stop them yes um Reduction, I do not have the statistics, mm. uh, but let's just look at uh, corruption cases mm. at uh, Milimani and Corruption Court. You have seen quite a number of people losing property. Applications have been made, property has been frozen, it has been seized and forfeited mm -hmm. uh, to the state. Uh, at least that that is in the public uh, domain. So then I don't know whether corruption is going down or whether it's still at the same level, but corruption still does exist. Remember, these are criminals who keep on imagining that they are way ahead of law enforcement officers. So as one loophole is closed one gap is closed Another they think of, of they become innovative we say they're very innovative so you'll keep on finding uh, ways uh, new ways of how uh, the money is flowing out and in of the country you know uh, illicit money may come even through importation of cars you just find someone has a car bazaar and people are paying cash. Mm. So you see, it is very hard to track that kind of money, isn't it? Mm. When someone comes and pays uh, for a vehicle cash, the uh, financial reporting center, the FRC, that's the financial intelligence unit, may not be able to pick that kind of transaction. So uh, from the judiciary perspective, I think, yes, we are doing very well. Magistrates and judges have been trained. We are actually training jointly with the intelligence officers prosecutors and uh, and terror police unit as well as uh, corrupt uh, uh, officers dealing with corruption so that we try and understand where the gaps are sometimes uh, we are blamed as the judiciary for acquitting criminals mm -hmm. and yet there is evidence but if the evidence is not presented well then as a judicial officer the, the threshold is beyond reasonable doubt if there are doubts this criminal will just have to go and if you have violated the rights of that criminal again, we will not countenance that. So I think there has been a reduction and we are actually sensitized enough. And that is why we are going for this regional training. As a region, we want to see how we can customize our problems, our jurisprudence. What is emerging in Uganda mm. that we could actually learn from them? What jurisprudence has emerged from, uh, say, uh, Ethiopia or uh, Mozambique or Zambia that we could actually borrow from them? How are the judicial officers, law enforcement officers, as well as intelligence officers collaborating so as to defeat this monster called uh, transnational organized crime? Overall, I would think having sat at Kahawa law courts, having sat at Shans law courts, which handle transnational organized crimes, that we are doing very well as a judiciary. We have seen lots of people convicted for terrorism. Uh, Milimani and Corruption Court is rendering super uh, decisions. You have seen some of the judges refusing with the withdrawal of high profile corruption cases. So I think we are on the right track and with 
continuous training and like at the regional training experts are going to come in they are going to talk to us mm. how best we can improve we are going to share how best we can uh, collaborate uh, with the other countries in the fight against transnational organized crimes okay um winding down the hour but even as we look at this, this dialogue taking place next week what can we hope to see thereafter whether it's at the court level whether it's at uh, the you know the uh, crime uh, investigative level what can we hope to see well i think uh, i know that what we're going to see is we're going to see and judges from 16 or 17 nations go back to their countries with more skills, uh, more resources, and more contacts amongst their peers to know how to address these cases. Uh, and with that sort of knowledge, it can only improve the ability of each judiciary to address transnational organized crime. Mm -hmm. And that's not only the goal, but I'm confident that, that will be the result. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think uh, we're going to get judicial officers and judges who are champions in the fight against uh, corruption, transnational organized crimes generally. We're going to see uh, judicial officers and judges who have passion. And when they go to court, they know that these crimes actually lead to political instability. They drain the economy of the country. Judges and magis judges who understand what they're supposed to do. And uh, of course, collaboration now, we can be able to share information. We can be able to, you know, uh, chat uh, through social media and what have you uh, so that uh, we are able as a region to you know to unite in the fight against transnational organized crime mm. yes all right that dialogue takes place on october 3rd to 5th uh, in mombasa and that happens next week and it'll be interesting to see the uh, proceeds essentially from this um honorable justice diana mochache a judge of the high court of kenya and scott afshaug thank you so much for being here scott is the u.s doj resident legal advisor in nairobi thank for having this conversation with us this hour important ones to have and it will be interesting to see how this opens up um, in the future again as you said corruption international crime things that take place around the world but affect the citizens of a country that need to be dealt with essentially with a hard hand mm -hmm. and seeing african countries come together and seeing ways in which they can work together to put and stamp this out mm -hmm. is definitely one worth having thank you once again for being in the situation room this morning my pleasure thanks so much for having me. thank you for having us this is the situation room the only way to start your day